Mary Robertson's one of my favorite reviewers. Uh, she's a lecturer at uh, Richland College. She's uh, adjunct faculty there. Uh, she's a retired librarian of the Plano Independent School District. Now, in, in other settings, I have introduced Mary with all the things she does to engage with history, assembling canons and doing his, history programs. Uh, but one thing I've never mentioned, and that is that she uh, put together, put the flowers on a float at the Rose Bowl Parade. So uh, she's done a lot of things. She really engages with the world. Uh, and today you're going to hear her talk about Eleanor Roosevelt. So welcome, Mary. Hello. I'm delighted that you're able to join us today as we take a look at Eleanor Roosevelt, who we finally call First Lady of the World. What she became was certainly far different from the young girl that we're going to meet. Franklin and Eleanor, An Extraordinary Marriage, is the book that started my whole adventure in looking into Eleanor's life and learning as much about her as I could find. The, uh, her mother, Anna Hall Roosevelt, was a beautiful woman. She came from a family of beautiful women, and the, uh, her father, Elliot Roosevelt, fell head over heels in love with her when he was on a trip to the South. Many people think that Anna Hall might have been the role model for Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind because Margaret Mitchell actually interviewed one of her bridesmaids. She was the last surviving bridesmaid from that wedding. And when Margaret interviewed her, they were at the plantation. She went through all of the exciting events leading up to the wedding. And many of the things she described in that article are similar to the description she has of Tara in Gone with the Wind. So it's interesting how the different families keep coming back up in other areas. Young Eleanor at about the age two, and you can see she is not a beautiful baby. She's a sweet baby, but she does definitely have that overbite. The, uh, her family didn't know what to do with her. All of these beautiful women in the family, and here comes this ordinary looking child. Her mother was even heard to say more than once, Eleanor, you're going to have to study hard and be very smart because with, since you're not beautiful, that's your only hope. Can you believe someone would say that to a young child? The, now, Eleanor and her father, Elliot, that's a different thing. He always called her his beautiful baby. He always loved on her and encouraged her, and he was her rock. Even after his death, whenever she described him, it was like he was her, shine, her knight in shining armor. And she talked about him as a sportsman or a, a partner at a real estate firm. Actually, he was an alcoholic that did very little in a career before his untimely death. Here's Eleanor with her father and brothers, Elliot and Hall. The, um, she is going to take responsibility for Hall because in a very short period of time, she will lose both her brother and her father and her mother. She lost three family members before she was 10 years old. Her mother died from diphtheria in 1892 her brother Elliot died a few months later in 1893. Her father died of alcoholism in 1894. And she would raise Brother Hall and be very much his mentor until his death in 1941 from alcohol-related causes. So having a brother that's an alcoholic and a father that's an alcoholic gave her very negative views about alcohol. And she was not... Uh, always interested in hosting cocktail parties. Young Eleanor is going to be raised by Grandmother Hall, who is the short lady on the left. This picture actually is Eleanor standing in the back, her daughter Anna sitting reading, and Sarah Roosevelt, her mother-in-law on one side, and her Grandmother Hall on the other. The problem with her being raised by Grandmother Hall is Grandmother Hall was still raising her children. She had a number of teenage sons and daughters. The daughters were beautiful. They were coming out as debutantes. The boys tended to drink and sometimes got out of hand, so much so that Grandmother Hall put a lock on Eleanor's bedroom door so that she didn't have to worry about somebody busting in in the middle of the night. Now here's a school portrait when she's in high school and you see that she is an attractive young lady. 
She is, has overcome some of the, the clumsiness that you saw as a two-year-old. And this is one of the statements that she would make repeatedly when she found herself in a difficult situation. A woman is like a tea bag. You can't tell how strong she is until you put her in hot water. And she was in hot water more than a few times. I will say that her uncle, Teddy Roosevelt, did everything he could to see that Eleanor got the proper education and had everything that she needed growing up. She spent many day, many weekends and holidays with uh, Teddy's family. The, uh, but this is when she really begins to bloom. She comes out of her shyness and becomes her own person when she is sent to Europe, to England, to Ellingswood Academy. Now at the academy, she's age 15 at this point, and she's the third girl from the right on the back row. The, um, she finds herself, she, she starts studying subjects that she'd not been exposed to before. At this time period, young girls were educated not to take on careers, but to be mothers and supportive wives. So she's going to be taught multiple languages. She's going to be taught music and art and literature. But when she gets to Allenswood, she's introduced to things like geometry, politics, economics, things that she had not had a chance to study before. Now, all the girls at Ellingswood did not start study those subjects. Maria Sylvester was the headmistress, and she wanted the girls all exposed to it, but there was a small cadre of girls that she would invite back to her apartments in the evening and expand their exposure to the things that were going on in the world at the time, politics, all kinds of things uh, on the different governments, whether the United States, England, European countries. So Maria opened her eyes to other subjects and knowledge base, and she was very influential in the woman that she would become. The other thing that she did was opened her eyes to the real world. During the school year, there were several holidays when the girls that lived in England and Europe would go home for the holidays. But because it was so difficult to get back and forth to the United States in a short period of time, Eleanor spent her holidays at school. And Mrs. S Miss uh, Sylvester would take her on her holiday travels. Not only did she expose her to things like the tenements and the poor sections, the uh, centers of governments for other countries, but she had Eleanor do all of the, the planning kind of things. She'd book the hotels, she would book the trains, she would study the places they were going so that they had an idea about what they wanted to see when they visited the different series. And this really made an impression on Eleanor, and it also gave her a self-confidence that she had not had before she went to Ellensworth, Ellenswood. But some of the things that she became interested in during that time were the Junior League at Riverton uh, Settlement. This is after she leaves Al Allenswood and before she gets married. She is continuing the kinds of studies that Mrs. Sylvester has introduced her to. And while she's working at the settlement house, she's teaching dancing and calisthenics. Now, this, you think, wow, that's just what people in the tenements need. But it really is, because they're working 12, 14-hour days, many of them sitting at machines or bent over, and the dancing and the calisthenics helped restore those muscles and keep them from getting humped over. She also became involved in the Consumers League in New York City. Part of her job was to investigate sweatshops and award white labels to those companies that made their work environment safer and, and more reasonable for their employees. So today people often look for a label that says made in the USA. Then they were encouraged to look for the white label that told them how that garment or item was made. In fact, uh, that was one of the things that she introduced her cousin Franklin Roosevelt to. Now, it's interesting because this picture, she is a striking young lady. And this is the young lady that, that Franklin saw on the train as they were both headed back to Hyde Park from, their, uh, from New York City. 
Now, they were distant cousins, and he and Eleanor had known each other from the time they were kids, but this was not the Eleanor that he had seen before she went to Allen's Wood. And so they got to visiting on the train and soon started planning to always meet on the train. And then she would introduce him to the, the settlement house and to many of her activities that he would come pick her up at the end of her work day. They decided to get engaged secretly in the fall of 1903. And that's because they knew they were going to have an issue with Franklin's mother. And they wanted time for her to get used to them dating because she had not realized they had been doing that. And hopefully they would win her over. Now, I've said that, uh, that Franklin was Eleanor's cousin, and he is, and many people wonder about them marrying their cousins. But I want you to notice the family tree. The last member of the family that they both shared was back in 1740 something. And so from that time on, there are two distinctively different families. So they are not close cousins at all. I mean, 1740 something is a long time ago. One of the things that Eleanor tried to do during the time from the secret engagement until they could announce one uh, was trying to win Sarah over because Eleanor had grown up without her own mother and she was hoping that she would be the daughter to Sarah and Sarah would be a mother to her. That didn't quite work out the way she wanted. The first thing that Sarah did when she found out that they were, were wanting to get engaged was she sent Franklin and several of his friends on a grand tour of Europe for six months and she was sure that at the end of the six months Franklin would have lost interest in, in Eleanor. What she didn't understand was both Franklin and Eleanor were great at writing letters. So when he got back, they were even more determined. They will finally get married March of 1905. Now at this time, Uncle Teddy is president and he offers them a chance to get married at the White House. But Eleanor doesn't want a big White House wedding. She wants a quiet family and close friend wedding. And so they will actually get married at her aunt's townhouse in New York City. But that date just happened to be the day of the St. Patrick's Day Parade in New York City. And guess who is the marshal of the parade? Uncle Teddy. So he marshals the parade as it goes through New York City, stops, gets off, goes to the townhouse, gives away the bride, attends the reception, and then goes on about his business. Now, the thing that makes this interesting, and I'm sure you've heard this about Teddy Roosevelt before, he wanted to be the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral. And so when he pops in to give away the bride, that's basically what happens. After the ceremony, Eleanor and Franklin are going to cut the cake and to have the reception, and they realize that all of their guests are in the other room with Uncle Teddy. So they know immediately that they will, he will be the star of that show. Now, they go to Hyde Park for a week for a very short honey honeymoon because Franklin is still in law school. And so they can't leave during the year. But at the end of the school year, they're going to take a three-month European honeymoon. And this is a picture from that time. And they, it's really interesting because he's holding her knitting and she's holding his pipe. The... Um, and at the end of that honeymoon, it was obvious these two were very much in love. Now, I need to say one other thing. At this point, Franklin is, has not finished law school, and he never does. He takes enough courses at Columbia and works long enough that he can pass the bar. And once he passes the bar, he drops out of law school because he's accomplished his goal. Now, when they come back from this honeymoon, Sarah has a surprise for them. She is so excited, she's bought them a townhouse, and it's right next door to hers. Oh, isn't that sweet? Oh, you bought the furniture, too. Wow, that was so generous. And you hired the staff? Okay, great. The what is this door in the hall? This is the outside wall. It goes to your townhouse? Oh, how convenient. And by the way, it only locks on Sarah's side. So the young couple have Sarah in their life every day. 
Franklin and Eleanor's first baby, Anna's born in May of 1906. And of course, Sarah has hired a nanny for her and Sarah kind of takes over raising the children. This is one of the great regrets of Eleanor's life is that she did not put up a bigger fight to keep control of raising her children. But anytime she tried to take control, the children ran straight to the grandmother and Sarah let them do whatever they want. And Franklin was not willing to get in the middle of the two women in his life, uh, which means he gave in to his mother just like Eleanor would do. Here's a family portrait with Sarah. And in this portrait, uh, you have the five children, Eleanor sort of in the middle, Franklin on one side and Sarah on the other side. This portrait is before Lucy Mercer. Lucy Mercer had been hired as Eleanor's social secretary. And she was a very good social secretary, very pretty lady. And for some reason, and we're not quite sure, she was either fired or quit about the time that Franklin becomes Assistant Secretary of the Navy. And amazingly enough, this is about the time of World War I, and Lucy Mercer is going to join the Navy and become a secretary for the Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Now, this picture is after Eleanor learns of Lucy Mercer's affair with Franklin. And that affair had been known by people at the, the Department of the Navy. In fact, um, at one point, Franklin is going to Europe to assist with uh, assessing naval needs, how they can, uh, can help their allies. And when he's gone for an extended period of time, on the way back, he gets sick on the ship, and he's very sick. And they notify Eleanor to have an ambulance standing by to move him to, high, uh, to a hospital. And so when she gets him out of the hospital at home, she's unpacking his suitcases and she finds a stack of letters tied with ribbons. Well, she's been writing him all this time and she thinks, isn't that sweet? Wait a minute, that's not my handwriting. And she realizes those letters are from Lucy Mercer. And there is no doubt left in anybody's mind that Lucy and Franklin are having an affair. Eleanor says she will give him a divorce. She wants no part. She had actually asked him for a promise when he proposed that he would never hurt her that way. She had had so many hurts in her life. She needed to be married to someone she could depend on. So they decide on a divorce. At dinner one night, they, decide, they tell Sarah what their plans are and what's happening. Now, they've got five children. The, Sarah is very calm. When Franklin finishes telling her his plans, she looks at him and she said, that's fine, Franklin, if that's what you choose to do, but I think you need to know from this point on, you will be cut out from the family fortune. All your inheritance will go to Eleanor and the children. Well, now that wasn't exactly what Franklin had in mind. So they rethink this and they come up with an agreement. They will stay married and Eleanor will try hard to make the marriage work. Of course, we know that, that this was something that went on for the rest of their lives, and he deceived her more than once in this area. They lived at Springwood, which was in Hyde Park when they were not in New York City. Now, the thing about Springwood is it belongs to Sarah. So Sarah makes all the decisions at Springwood. Who can they invite, invite as guests? Who comes to dinner? It was a very awkward situation, and it lasted most of Franklin's life. His mother passed away just a short time before he did. The Lewis Howell is going to become a close friend for both Eleanor and Franklin during this time period, and he's going to try to salvage Franklin's political career when, after he has polio. But the first uh, campaign that Lewis is going to work with him on is in 1920, and it is Roosevelt running as vice president with Cox running as president. Now, this is going to be a major election that they lose, but they're going to learn a lot about campaigning for national office during this time, and the, the trains with the whistle stops are going to be very important during this time. 
after the elections lost, they go back to Campobella, New Brunswick. This is their summer home, and this is one of Eleanor's happy places because Sarah doesn't like Campobella, so she rarely goes. So when the family is there, Eleanor is in charge. She is the one that is taking care of the family. And it's a, t a happy place for all of the family. And you see right after the, they lost the campaign, there they are at Campobello. They've been swimming in the ocean. They love to sail. The children love to sail. And in fact, Franklin was sailing, sailing at Campobello on the day that he came down with polio. They had been out on the water. They were headed back. He had the boys with him. They were headed back home, getting ready for the evening, when they noticed a smoke. And on an island, when you have smoke and a fire, it endangers everybody on the island. So everybody joins in to help. So he pulls in the slip, and he and the boys try to help put out the fire. When they finally get it out, they get back in the boat and go home. But Franklin is exhausted. So when Eleanor announces dinner's ready, he said, I just, I can't even think about food. I'm so tired, I'm going straight up to bed. And when she went up to check on him a little later, he did have a fever, and so she let him sleep through the night. But the next morning, he had major stiffness in his legs, and things began to deteriorate from there. Now, you need to remember, in that time frame, polio was called infantile paralysis because it was mostly a disease of children. So they did not diagnose him with polio right off. Eleanor tried to follow any suggestions that would keep his legs mobile. They were sometimes painful for him, but they did try physical therapy where she would massage his legs, move them around. Finally, the doctor said, this is more serious than we thought, and we've got to get him back to New York City to the hospital. Well, that got to be fun because here is a young man who wants to be a politician, and if they find that he is sick with something like polio, it would ruin his political career. So they've got to get him back to New York City without anyone seeing that it's Franklin that's sick. So Eleanor and the children go first in a separate boat back to the mainland. They hold a press conference while Franklin's brought in on a different boat from a different direction. They've got all the reporters' eyes on her. And then, of course, they have a little trouble getting the stretcher on the train because they don't have a private car like they would have at the back of the train. So they have to push him in through the window because you can't really turn corners on the, the doors of a train. When they get to New York City, they repeat the same thing. Eleanor holds a little press conference with all the kids coming back from summer break while they get him to the hospital. And that's when they know that it is polio. And that's when Eleanor finally took a stand against Sarah Roosevelt and took control. Now, one of the things that Sarah wanted was for him to retire to Hyde Park and just be a country gentleman and give up his plans for politics or anything else. Eleanor absolutely refused, and she worked and worked to help him restore as much use of his body as he could. But Warm Springs was one of the places that helped him recover more than anything. It was a great discovery because in the water, when he's not having to bear his body's weight, he on his feet. He can move around more freely. He can exercise more. And he did improve during the, the times at Warm Springs. And it became a regular retreat for him. <clears throat> Once he's able to stand up, not on his own, he's got steel braces on there and he's holding on to one of his sons. Once he can stand up, the media cooperated with them and didn't take pictures of the struggle to get him into a standing position so that any images they saw in the news media, he looked like he was just had a little limp and that he had returned to normal. All the time that he was sick, Eleanor is going to make major changes in her life and she is going to become the political face of the family. But before she gives up her, her activities, I need for you to know what those were. She has some friends, Marion Dickerman and Nancy Cook, who are a couple. And with Eleanor, they will found a Todd Hunter School in New York City. It's a school for young ladies where Eleanor is going to teach. They also found Valkyl Industries, which is a manufacturing 
uh, for furniture in Tide Park. And these both are very successful. And by the way, Sarah Roosevelt does not like Marion and Nancy at all, and they are not welcome at Hyde Park. But if you ever get a chance to see the furniture, it is beautifully done, and it is a high dollar collectible now. He gets elected as governor of New York State, and as first lady of the state, she is forced to resign from her teaching. She will go into New York City one day a week and do some lectures, but she gives up a lot of, of that because she now has responsibilities as first lady. Um, one of the things that Franklin is going to do is hire a chauffeur for her, and this is Earl Miller, and they become very good friends, and he is, he is going to be her encourager and support. Her children now are old enough that they can say, and they've heard Sarah say, unpleasant things about how dowdy she looks and, and, and not encourage her. Franklin had to hire the chauffeur, though, because her driving was so erratic to other drivers on the road in New York, they were afraid to be on the road when Eleanor was driving. So Earl becomes her chauffeur and her companion when she is, is out during the day. Um, he's going to buy a horse for her. They will do a lot of horseback riding. He encourages her whenever she has public uh, lectures to make. And their friendship becomes so strong that there actually are rumors that they may be having an affair. Well, now at this time, they've already replaced Lucy Mercer, and he has a secretary called Missy Lahan, and there are rumors that he's having an affair with Missy. So Franklin comes up with this brilliant idea to stop all the rumors. If Earl would just marry Missy, that would end all of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Earl did not like the idea. He did marry somebody else, which did put an end to those rumors, but they did remain friends for a long time. Now, while Franklin is recovering from polio and while he is governor of New York, Eleanor is going to be the face of the, the Roosevelt family. She's going to be a member of the City Club of New York, the Women's City Club of New York, the Women's Trade Union, the Women's Division of the, the New York State Democratic Committee, the chair of the Women's Delegation of the Platform Committee, the League of Women Voters, the World Peace Movement, and a writer, a lecturer, a radio show commentator from 1921 to 62. Those are all roles she took on while he's recovering and after he's elected to keep his name in the media and to keep all of the activities covered without that kind of physical strain on Franklin. And she will change drastically during this time period. Her voice was not really a strong speaking voice until Lewis Howell helped her develop a stronger voice. She had been a little timid at first with large crowds and the the uh, Democratic Convention would be considered a large crowd, but after working with him and working with so many different organizations, she could speak anywhere, anytime, and feel very confident. Now, you remember the train being a part of campaigns when he was running for vice president. Now, it, this is how he's going to campaign because physically it's easier than getting in and out of cars and going places. But you will always see him with one hand either on a cane or on this case the banister and the other hand in somebody, in one of the family members or someone's arm so that he is holding himself up. He would not be able to do that without Eleanor standing there. As governor of New York State, he becomes very well known by the way he handles the uh, depression and so he becomes a very popular candidate and uh, they elect him in 1933 and this was a real blow to Eleanor because that meant she had to give up most of her interest in order to fulfill her role as first lady and she is not going to be a traditional first lady she is going to expand the role by necessity to help Franklin and as she's doing so, she is, is establishing her presence as well as his. Some of the first during her time as First Lady, and she will serve as First Lady longer than anyone else, uh, 
and that's the first thing, first to hold news conferences, first incumbent first lady to travel by an airplane, first incumbent first lady to travel outside the United States without the president, and during the time of the war and leading up to it, she will travel to England, uh, to South Pacific, to the Caribbean, um, and we'll go into that detail a little bit later. Uh, she visited over 400,000 U.S. servicemen, and many of those servicemen felt like mother had come to visit because she was very hands-on, particularly with those that were wounded. And she's the first First Lady to testify before a congressional committee. Lorena Hitchcock is one of the reporters that's assigned to the First Lady. And the thing about this is, one, they are going to become good friends, and there are rumors about that, but according to her grandkids, that's all they were, were rumors. So we're not going into that. What we are going into is Lorena was prohibited from attending the news conferences with the president. The only uh, reporters that could attend the president's news conferences were male reporters. And so Eleanor is going to work with Lorena to change that to the and make their point by making only female reporters welcomed at Eleanor's uh, news conferences. Now, Eleanor's going to take on a number of causes that may not have been Franklin's first choice, but he was not going to interfere. He, he agreed with her and let her take the lead in a number of civil rights issues, one of them being Marian Anderson. She was a contralto soprano, beautiful operatic voice, had given concerts and sung in operas all over the world. And she's wanting to do a concert in Washington, D.C. And she goes to Constitutional Hall, which is owned by the DAR, and tries, or her manager does, and tries to schedule a concert. And the funny thing is, there just were never any dates that would work. Of course, those dates worked fine for other people. And when Eleanor found out that they had refused Marion Anderson the opportunity to do a concert, she went to the the National Park Department and arranged for her to give a concert on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. It was attended by thousands of people and it made her point. We would not bar people from performing, from being a part of, of the society because of their color. Another place that she really spoke out on that was with the Tuskegee Airmen. They had trained as, as uh, escort pilots for our bombers in the war. And when they got ready to take on active duty and actually start escorting the bombers, the military wouldn't let them. They weren't fit to fly. I mean, they were, were black pilots. Who ever heard of such thing? They wouldn't be safe to fly. And Eleanor said, well, they'd be safe as anybody else, and I'll just show it. So she took several flights with Tuskegee Airmen. And when she'd get back, she would rave about what competent pilots they were. Well, with the First Lady doing that, they had to let them escort some of the bombers. And the interesting thing is they became the, the favorites of the pilots of the bombers because whenever the Tuskegee Airmen were escorting them, they arrived at their target safely. And any time there was any uh, German planes assigned to interfere, the Tuskegee Airmen were able to take care of that so that the bombers got to their sites. She would also visit Pearl Harbor and many other bases. When she did her first visit, the, uh, one of the admirals was upset that they had to take away energy away from fighting the war to host the First Lady. But after her visit, she, they said, if we could just have a few more first ladies to raise morale, we could get this war won quicker. She was a favorite among the armed forces. And on that plane is a picture of her that says, Our Eleanor. And the, whenever she went to visit in the hospital, she would write letters to the mothers of the young men that had been injured. And so she was very much a positive force in, because of her visits. She's going to write My Day columns six days a week from 1936 to 1962. Now, I should say she's going to dictate 
those columns because her secretary would follow her around while she was getting from place to place and she would dictate those columns. And that was really, she even talks about her last hospitalization in one of her last uh, uh, articles. She's going to give 348 press conferences over those 12 White House years. Only women press allowed. Her radio show was from 1933 to 1945, the White House years, and she will be the first of the administration to speak to the public on December 7th. The, um, I'm going to read a couple of things. One is uh, the radio segment that she broadcast on December the 8th. She will be the first to speak, and this is what she's telling the American people while Franklin and the Congress is trying to respond to the, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm speaking to you tonight at a very serious moment in our history. The cabinet is convening and the leaders in Congress are meeting with the president at the, right now. By tomorrow morning, the members of Congress will have a full report and be ready for actions. In the meantime, we the people are already prepared for action. For months now, the knowledge that something of this kind might happen has been hanging over our heads, and yet it seemed impossible to believe, impossible to drop the everyday things of life and feel that there was only one thing which was important, preparation to meet an enemy no matter where he struck. That is all over now, and there's no more uncertainty. We know what we have to face, and we know that we're ready to face it. We must go about our daily business more determined than ever to do the ordinary things as well as we can, and when we find a way to do anything more in our communities to help others to build morale, to give a feeling of security, we must do it, whatever is asked of us. I should like to say just a word to the women in the country tonight. I have a boy at sea on a destroyer. For all I know, he may be on his way to the Pacific. Two of my children are in coast cities on the Pacific. Many of you all over the country have boys in the services who will now be called upon to go into action. You have friends and families in what, was suddenly, what has suddenly become a danger zone. You cannot escape anxiety. You cannot escape a clutch of fear at your heart. And yet I hope that the certainty of what we have to meet will make you rise above these fears. To the young people of the nation, I must speak a word tonight. You are going to have a great opportunity. There will be high moments in which your strength and your ability will be tested. I have faith in you. I feel as though I am standing upon a rock, and that rock is my faith in my fellow citizens. And now we will go back to the program we had arranged. That was given immediately after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. The next day, in her column, she's going to write, trying to, to give calm and, and normal, normal to see to a different a situation that will never be normal. Washington, Sunday. I was going out in the hall to say goodbye to our cousins, Mr. and Miss Frederick Adams and their children after lunch. And as I stepped out of my room, I knew something had happened. All the secretaries were there. Two telephones were in use. The senior military aides were on their way with messages. I said nothing because the words I heard over the telephone were quite sufficient to tell me that finally the blow had fallen. I think perhaps it is significant that we should be beginning Bible Week today. This is the first annual Bible Week, so designated by the Layman's National Committee under the honorary chairman of Dr. Frank Kingdom. This committee believes that religious faith and knowledge of the Bible are essential to the preservations of our freedoms. Those were just excerpts from those two very important messages that she got out the night, the day of Pearl Harbor, and the next day while the President and the Congress was, were getting ready. Her radio shows were very valuable to Franklin. He had his, his fireside chats, and sometimes things that were said on the fireside chats got negative re reviews. 
she would then bring up the same subject in a different format on her program to try to encourage the American people to look at things from many different directions. Sometimes he would float a balloon on her program. Give a, she would mention something that might be used during the Depression or during the war and see how the reaction, if it was a negative reaction and people said, you need to, to reel Eleanor in. She has some radical ideas, he'd say. Now, I can't stop Eleanor. She has a mind of her own, which, of course, she did. This is Missy Lahan, as she was called, and she would be the secretary that would be with Franklin uh, through most of the war years and through the Depression. She would also be the junior wife at the White House, which was something Eleanor encouraged because while she was traveling for Franklin, while all of the activities she was covering from him, she needed somebody to take over the, the head housekeeper kind of, of thing and to hostess the cocktail parties for Franklin. And so Missy Lahan would be that person. And they would have a close personal relationship the, uh, until she has a stroke. And when she has the stroke in uh, 1941, uh, after a short period of recovery time, they will be moving Missy back home with her family, and Franklin will arrange for her, all her needs to be cared for. She will, of course, accompany him to Warm Springs because Eleanor does not like Warm Springs. Georgia is very segregated during this time, and that's very offensive to Eleanor. So she goes only when she has to. Other times, she sends Missy until Missy's stroke. Remember I said that, that Springwood was uh, Sarah's home and they could not invite guests that Sarah didn't approve of. So Franklin is going to build two houses, one for Eleanor so that she can invite her friends and one for himself. And this is Valkyll. Uh, they, and Valkyll, by the way, is Dutch for waterfall or stream. So in that part of New York, you're going to hear kill many times. That's the word for water. The, uh, this is a house he designed for her, and it is like going to visit a friend. I had a chance to visit the home not too long ago. Her knitting is still laid out, her books that she was reading. I felt like I could sit down and have a cup of tea and visit with her and be right at home. She was a very down-to-earth lady. This is Top Cottage, the house he built for him so that he could invite the friends he wanted. They could could entertain together or they could entertain separately, but it gave them a sense of ownership that they had not had at Springwood. This, by the way, is the lawn that they entertain the King and Queen of Europe on when they serve them hot dogs. The, this is the Roosevelt's 13 grandchildren at Franklin's fourth inaugural. This is an area that Eleanor feels she had failed at with her five children. In fact, there were many divorces. Uh, Franklin Jr. I mean, had uh, five himself. So uh, this was something that she always regretted that she had given in to Sarah. And she made sure she did not let that happen with her grandchildren. She was very involved in their lives. And they all say she taught them how to give back to the community, how to be a responsible citizen. Here she is at a party she gave every year from boys from an inner city school that she sponsored. And some of the boys that are closest to her are her grandchildren who are helping her to entertain those boys out at Valkyll. The uh, April 1945 took all, everybody by surprise. Franklin had been traveling a lot, trying to negotiate the end of the war, trying to, to establish what would happen at the end of the war. And he had a major stroke when he was at Warm Springs. Now the thing about this is Lucy Mercer was at Warm Springs with him. Lucy had married a widower. She had a child of her own. The widower had died. After the widower died, they resumed their relationship. And most times when he was at Warm Springs, Lucy would be with him. She was with him that day when he had the cerebral hemorrhage and died. The thing that upset Eleanor the most was that her daughter Anna had known about it from some time and had kept the affair a secret from her mother. 
she finally convinced her mother that she did it out of love for her mother, not her father. She couldn't stop the affair, but if she could keep her mother from the heartache, she would try. They, it took a while for them to, to reestablish their relationship. Shortly after Franklin's death, President Truman is going to ask her to represent us as a delegate to the United Nations. She would be a valuable asset. She spoke many of the language that would, languages pardon me, that would be needed. She also understood the governments and it had interaction with the leaders of many of the major governments. The other members, the male members, thought that she was just going to be window dressing and they were very surprised when she was not window dressing but taking a leadership role and she would become chairperson of the UN Commission on Human Rights. That was her proudest accomplishment because she saw how these refugees from the war were having difficulties that far exceeded anyone's expectation. And one of the most difficult was locating their surviving relatives. And so this committee established the uh, document on human rights and she was very pleased with it. She is going to remain politically active well into her 70s. John Kennedy would seek, in, seek support and, and uh, opinions from her while he was running for president and while he was president. She was not very fond of John F. Kennedy because he was a womanizer and she knew how painful that was. But she did assist him with her opinions during uh, the later part of her life. The Eleanor Roosevelt has a monument in Riverside Park in New York City. Now this is unusual. There until recently were no monuments to women in Central Park and none in, in uh, Riverside Park either before Eleanor's. Uh, but they did erect this in 1996 and it, is, it honors her. In the past couple of weeks, they've erected a monument in Central Park that recognizes the suffragettes that worked to get the vote for women. So these are very um, important women in our history. To give you an idea of how widely admired she was, this is a top 10 list of widely admired people of the 20th century. Mother Teresa's at the top, then Martin Luther King, John Kennedy, Albert Einstein, Helen Keller, Franklin Roosevelt, Billy Graham, Pope John Paul II. Number nine is Eleanor Roosevelt, and number 10 is Winston Churchill. Her contributions during the Depression and during the war to restore faith, to encourage people, and to help win that war brought her so much admiration from the people of the world, not just from Americans. And that's why we call her First Lady of the World. Thank you so much for being here today. I hope you learned something about Eleanor and her many interests and activities. The, and I hope to see you again in the near future. Goodbye.